My name is Danica, I'm an associate editor at Book Riot, and today I have some new releases to tell you about that are out this week, March 30th. I am back in my old filming location. I tried so hard to make the big shelves work, but I just got so much reflection on my glasses that it was really annoying me, and I'm sure it was annoying you. So I'm back in my little cramped filming space, and hopefully this is an improvement. So let's jump right into the books out this week. The first is Liberty by Caitlin Greenridge. Liberty came of age as a freeborn black girl in Reconstruction era Brooklyn. She was all too aware of her purposeful mother's vision for their future. Liberty would go to medical school and practice alongside her. But Liberty is drawn more to music than science, and she feels stifled by her mother's choices. She's hungry for something else. Is there really only one way to have an autonomous life? She is also constantly reminded that, unlike her mother, Liberty has skin that is too dark to pass. When a young man from Haiti proposes to Liberty, he promises that she will be his equal on the island. Liberty accepts, only to find that she is still subordinate to him and all men. As she tries to parse what freedom really means as a black woman, Liberty struggles for where she might find it, for herself and for generations to come. So this is a historical fiction title inspired by one of the first black women doctors in the US. It's from the author of We Love You Charlie Freeman. This is supposed to have a lot of historical detail, and it's being compared to Britt Bennett and Ya Jesse's books. Next up I have a YA thriller called She's Too Pretty to Burn by Wendy Hurd. The summer is winding down in San Diego. Veronica is bored, caustically charismatic, and uninspired in her photography. Nico is insatiable, subversive, and obsessed with chaotic performance art. They're artists first, best friends second. But that was before Mick. Delicate, lonely, magnetic Mick. The perfect subject and Veronica's dream girl. The days are long and hot, full of adventure, and soon they are falling in love. Falling so hard they never imagine what happens next. One fire, two murders, three drowning bodies. One suspect, one stalker. This is a summer they won't survive. So this is a YA psychological thriller that's supposed to be inspired by the picture of Dorian Gray, which I don't understand at all and I'm so interested to see how that fits into this story. It takes place in an edgy art scene. It looks like it's going to be a really high stakes, fast paced read. I'm definitely looking forward to this one. I have been anticipating it since the first publication announcement, so I'm really excited to get my hands on on this one. Next up is Tiger Girl and the Candy Kid, America's original gangster couple by Glenn Stout. Before Bonnie and Clyde, there was the Tiger Girl and the Candy Kid. Smarter, more successful, and better looking. In the wake of war, a pandemic, and an economic recession, Margaret and Richard Whittemore, two love-struck working-class kids from Baltimore, reached for the dream of a better life. In the heart of the Jazz Age, they headed up a gang that stole over one million dollars worth of diamonds and other gems over the course of one year what would be worth 15 million dollars today. Margaret was a chic flapper, supporting her husband and his crimes in every way. Richard was the quintessential bad boy whose cunning and violent amorality turned their dreams into reality. Along the way he killed at least three men, and when he promised to confess if she was set free, they became heroes to a generation of young Americans, making headlines all across the country as the tabloids breathlessly reported the details of their star-crossed romance. Set against the backdrop drop of the excesses of the Roaring Twenties, their story takes us from jailhouses to speakeasies, from the cabarets where they celebrated good times, to the gallows where their story finally came to an end. Tiger Girl and the Candy Kid is a tale of rags to riches, tragedy, and infamy. So this is a biography of America's first gangster couple. It's got a ton of sources in the back, apparently about a quarter of this book is actually just the sources, so if you want to learn even more you can check those out. It follows them from petty criminals to powerful gangsters to their downfall. If you are a true crime fan, or you like reading about the Roaring Twenties, you want to read about some 1920s jewel robberies, then definitely check this one out. Next is The Final Revival of Opal and Nev by Donnie Walton. Opal is a fiercely independent young woman who pushes against the grain in her style and attitude. She was Afro-punk before the term existed. She can't imagine settling for a 9-to-5 job. Despite her unusual looks, Opal believes she can be a star. So when the aspiring 
aspiring British singer-songwriter Neville discovers her at a bar's amateur night. She takes him up on his offer to make rock music together for the fledgling Rivington Records. In early 70s New York City, just as she's starting to find her niche in a funky creative scene, a rival band signed to the record brandishes a Confederate flag at a concert. Opal's bold protest and the violence that ensues sets off a chain of events that will not only change the lives of the people she loves, but will also be a deadly reminder that repercussions are always harsher for women, especially black women who dare to speak their truth. Decades later, as Opal considers a 2016 reunion with Nev, a music journalist seizes the opportunity to curate an oral history about her idols. Sunny thought she knew most of the stories leading up to the duo's most politicized chapter, but as her interviews dig deeper, a nasty new allegation from an unexpected source threatens to blow up everything. So this is historical fiction of a 1970s Afropunk group. This is being compared a lot to Daisy Jones and the Six. You have an oral history format, but I'm told that the format is taken a step further in this one, and that the main characters are very different, and that Opal is a character that you will not be able to forget. Then there's Of Women and Salt by Gabriela Garcia. In modern day Miami, Jeanette is battling addiction. Daughter of Carmen, a Cuban immigrant, she is determined to learn more about their family history from her reticent mother, and she makes the snap decision to take in the daughter of a neighbor who is detained by ICE. Carmen, still struggling with the trauma of displacement, must process her difficult relationship with her own mother while trying to raise a wayward Jeanette. Steadfast in her quest for understanding, Jeanette travels to Cuba to see her grandmother and reckon with secrets from the past destined to erupt. From 19th century cigar factories to present-day detention centers, from Cuba to Mexico, of Woman and Salt is a kaleidoscope portrait of betrayals, personal and political, self-inflicted, and those done by others that have shaped the lives of these extraordinary women. So this is supposed to be a meditation on the choices of mothers and about the legacy of family histories. It's a story about diaspora, but also about the U.S. and its roots. This is the debut from this author, and I get the feeling that this is one people are going to be talking about a lot. And my last pick for this video is Girlhood by Melissa Phoebos. Girlhood examines the narratives we are told about what it is to be a woman and what it takes to free oneself from from them. When her body begins to change at 11 years old, Phoebus understood immediately that her meaning to others had changed with it. By her teens, she defined herself by these perspectives, and by the romantic relationships that she threw herself into headlong. Over time, Phoebus increasingly questioned the stories she'd been told about herself, and the habits and defenses she developed after years of trying to meet others' expectations. The values that she and so many other women learned in childhood did not prioritize their personal safety, happiness, or freedom, and she set out to reframe those values and beliefs. Blending investigative reporting, memoir, and scholarship, Phoebos charts how she and others like her have reimagined relationships and made room for the anger, grief, power, and pleasure that women have been taught to deny. So this is a collection of essays that's supposed to be a kind of treatise of womanhood. It's about the transition from girlhood to being a woman and the forces that shape girls into the women they become. The author has talked about in interviews how this is a reflection of her own girlhood and womanhood, and that obviously she can't represent all women, including trans women and women of all races and cultures. So this looks like it's going to be a very thought-provoking read. And those are all the books that I have for you this week. Let me know in the comments if you are interested in reading any of these, or if I missed a book that you're excited about that's out this week. If you want to find out about even even more new releases, you can subscribe to Book Riot's All the Books podcast. I am one of the co-hosts there, so the first Tuesday of the week I talk about new releases in a lot more depth that I've actually read. There's also Book Riot's New Books newsletter, and I get most of my picks from Book Riot's Insider's New Releases Index, so if you want to keep track of all of the week's new releases, I highly recommend that. It is a great resource. And if you've watched all the way to the end, please let me know by leaving a salt emoji for Of Women and Salt, or just use the word salt somewhere in your comment. And until next time, happy reading! My dogs have been making appearances in earlier videos, but my poor pup just had surgery on her foot. And she is quite pathetic, but in an adorable way. She's doing well.